Hey folks, welcome back once again to Indaba Africa. This is Chris coming to you live from central Pennsylvania, quite a ways off from where my guest is at today in South Africa. Well, listen, um, I'll tell you, sometimes you get lucky. I reached out to Steve Hofmeyer and within 24 hours, he agreed to be a guest on the channel and I was able to track him down. This guy is like a unicorn. I'm telling you, it's hard to get a hold of him. When he came to DC, I tried to reach out, but he had more people, important people to talk to. That's not being facetious. That's a genuine comment. So I couldn't reach him when he came back over. He probably never even knew that, knew that I reached out to him. But I've been trying to get him on the channel now for about five months, and he's incredibly busy but with all the nonsense going on in South Africa and standing up for civil rights there. So, folks, what I want to do now is welcome my guest today, my special feature guest, the day before the U.S. election, uh, the one, the only, Ernst Ritz. Ernst, you're on the screen. Welcome. Hello, Chris. Uh, thank you. It's, it's great to be on the show, finally. And um, I'm sorry that it, it uh, took some effort to, to arrange this interview, but uh, I have been following your show and I'm, I'm grateful to be, to be part of it. Excellent. Well, don't, don't sweat that. No, I just give me a hard time. I'm, I'm also, uh, you, you're in competition for Mimi Kalinda, who runs a public relations firm in South Africa. Uh, I, it took me five months to get her on as well. So I think that you got to beat by a day or two. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it. Uh, it's going well. I actually just returned from from holiday. It was school holidays this past week, um, so I took some leave as well. And um, uh, me and the family, my wife and the kids, uh, we had we had the week off. And uh, I've just returned, so I'll be back back in action tomorrow. Um, but I'm well rested, and um, I don't know if people if I don't know if I have a tan or not. But I've been in the sun quite a bit for the last week. Um, so it's going very well, and it's going well with the F3 Forum. Um, uh, it's not going too well with South Africa, no. but uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Absolutely. So uh, did you do any hunting while you were on your holiday? <laughs> no, actually not. No, we went, uh, we went to the sea. We went to KwaZulu-Natal, uh, to, uh, to Belito, and we spent, some, we spent a few days, uh, days there. But as I said, we're back now. I'm at my house. Oh, that's lovely. I, uh, I appreciate that people enjoy the beach, but I'm not a beach person. I was always too skinny and too short, ribs exposed. And I was always embarrassed. I got burned really, <laughs> got burned really badly because unlike the EFF who would look at me and say that I'm white, I'm actually kind of pink. And so I fried pretty badly in the sun. <laughs> uh, well, I, I actually agree with you. This is the reason why we went to the sea now is because I've never, I've, ne I've never taken my, my children to, to, to the sea because uh, I'm also more more of a, uh, a Bushveld uh, savanna type uh, person. And I always uh, rather, I would rather go to the mountains than to the sea. Um, so this was sort of out of the ordinary for me. Um, my typical holiday is usually to go, you know, to some uh, nature reserve or to go a, a few years ago, we went up uh, with a, a, you know, on, a, on a safari trip into Africa. We drove through uh, Botswana into Zambia. We went to the north of Zambia. Then we went to Malawi and through Zimbabwe, we came back. Um, that was a wonderful trip. Um, so that's, and you know, we spent a lot of time in the bush there. We went to South Luangwa, uh, the nature reserve. We saw actually on, on one hunting trip, we saw four leopards on one trip. Wow. And, um, and if you stay where, where you stay, there, there aren't fences around the camp. Um, so the first night we were there, the following morning, um, uh, we saw the elephant footprints between our tents. And uh, some of the people who were with us actually woke up. They said they couldn't scream at us to say, hey, the elephants are here. So they just lie, they just lay awake in their tents and listen to the elephants. Uh, but that's, that's the perfect, perfect uh, type of, of holiday for me. Well, that's, I would agree. That's an awesome holiday. I would enjoy that as well. I, uh, I'll tell you that, uh, speak of things moving in the dark, it reminds me of when I was in the Gulf War the first time and, and armored vehicles were moving at night um, and some were moving out ground guides. You know, unfortunately, I had a soldier crushed to death. So I was, when you mentioned the elephants, that's what I was thinking of because they're moving mm -hmm. around at almost zero illumination and without a ground guide and someone was in a sleeping bag, you can't see mm -hmm. them, that sort of thing. But yeah, it makes yeah. me think of that. Now, the, what you just discussed there, you talk about that, an awesome trip. Uh, it sounds like uh, the best job in Southern Africa, which uh, most people don't know. It's actually the defense advisor or defense attache from Canada because the Canadian attache in Pretoria is accredited to 14 countries in Southern Africa. So like three times during their tour, they get to travel all over Southern Africa and they hit all these game parks and everything. It's the best job in Southern Africa. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds incredible. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and get right into the meat of things here. Uh, audience is building here. We've given people a chance to show up on a tardy basis. So <laughs> you are the deputy CEO of Afro Forum, which is a civil rights organization based in South Africa, correct? 
yes, sort of correct. Actually, we changed the titles. We don't have um, uh, deputy CEOs at AFRI Forum any, anymore. We changed to to uh, what we call a functional structure. Mm -hmm. So instead of just saying deputy CEO, your, your job title actually describes what you are doing. Um, so although I still have the same hold the same position, my, my official title is now head of policy and action, which means that um, what, what falls under me or what I'm in charge of or responsible for in AFRI Forum is communications and our campaigns, particularly our national campaigns, um, international uh, campaigns as well. Um, and then I'm also CEO of Forum Films, which is a company owned by Afri Forum. It's a film production company that makes um, uh, well a wide variety of multimedia uh, uh, films. Um, some of the viewers might have seen uh, Tainted Heroes and and uh, um, Disrupted Land are two of the the longer format documentaries that that we filmed. Um, and in terms of Afri Forum, it's a civil rights organization. We were founded in 2006, and uh, we don't get any funding from or corporations or anything like that. The only funding we get is from our members. Um, so to be a member, you have to make a monthly contribution. You can decide how, decide how much you want. Um, and we are the largest in, in the largest civil rights group on the African continent. And we did a study to find out if there are bigger civil rights groups in the Southern Hemisphere, in in Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, uh, South America and so forth. And we couldn't find any. So we're convinced that we're the largest civil rights group in the Southern Hemis Hemisphere as well. And we currently have uh, just over 260,000 members and, of course, their families as well who, who make contributions to our work. No, that's what I was going to ask you. So, so OK, if I understand correctly, you've changed the functional titles. So that title of deputy CEO is still out there. Listen, my CV will be in the email. Just check that, OK? Okay. <laughs> well, you can apply, but the position doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> well, there you go. So I, then, I can then I can complain that they didn't give me any love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, that's uh, thank you for correcting. That's important. I didn't realize the structure changed a little bit there. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, I, I'm not wanna, I'm, I'm going to open this topic now. We're not going to talk about it now, but we'll talk about it after we talk about off reform. And just, just to give you context here. So, of course, um, I, I think you know well that I'm a retired military officer i've been all over africa stationed all over the continent including in southern africa I've been to south africa hundreds of times but the first time i heard of off reform was uh by the press the lame stream as i like to call them or fake stream media who uh, <laughs> reported on it and said it was extreme right-wing nationalist group like the africana uh Verstandsbewegung or something like that and i was like really i thought those guys were all gone what's this all about and so i started looking and uh, I, I looked up for you guys, I read about it, and I'm like, I, I don't get what this is all about. So we don't want to go into that now. I want to go into it later, but just that was my introduction to off reforms the first time I heard about it. I was like, okay, that's strange. And obviously that's not the case, and we could talk more about that as we go on. But there's so much to unpack today and talk to you about, Ernst. Uh, for instance, I mean, you guys are pursuing this case against uh, uh, Andile Bonehead. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his last name. I call him Andile Bonehead. But uh, And then, of course, we've got Senegal 1, <laughs> Senegal 2. We've got... We've got the rash of the seven murders in, in, in October. It's unbelievable. The number of attacks are up. Um, the brutality of these things is not diminishing at all. We see, we see you know, um, all over the country, especially in KZN, lots of murders. We see the Indian lady who is 26 years old, four months pregnant. Um, they yeah. take her out of the room with her four and eight-year-old son, take her to the bathroom, and then cut her throat and leave her, and leave her to die. And Edward Neumeister, an Austrian immigrant who's been in South Africa for nearly 50 years, is beaten with a panga so badly that his daughter can't even recognize him. Yet he's, he's mortally wounded, yet at the age of 67 has the strength to go in and disrupt this clown as he's attacking his partner and she's able to escape. And all this nonsense about these are about theft, but but there was nothing stolen from Edward Neumeister and there's nothing stolen from many of these places. There are th thefts, but usually it's just the vehicle so they can get away. The Bront family in the Northern Cape, 83-year-old father, 73-year-old mother. I mean, these are all just recent cases and, and I haven't even talked about the ones in the Pumalanga that just happened. And of course, Brendan Horner, which finally got some attention from outside of South Africa. This must be a terribly distressing uh, function to be looking at these farm murders and, and trying to combat this without the government's help. Yes, it is very distressing, and it's something that that not only we at Afri Forum, I think people who are concerned about South Africa are very concerned about, and with good reason. Uh, but what makes it worse for us is, 
And I think that's part of the reason why people are so angry and why people were so angry. You spoke about Sienekal and people talk about Sienekal 1 and Sienekal 2. It's because there were these two events in, in the town of Sienekal. Uh, what happened at Sienekal 1, uh, there were some comment, not only commentators, police generals and, and um, uh, politicians, members of the ruling party who said they do not understand why the people are so angry because the the perpetrators have been arrested already, or the accused at least, and they are being trialed. So why are the people so angry if the people have been caught? Um, and if you, to say that is simply to indicate that you have no idea about the extent of the frustration uh, among minorities in this country and among people who aren't left-wing <laughs> in this country, um, and, and among Afrikaners, I think, in particular. Because what's more concerning than simply the murders, look, the murders are horrible. Uh, Gang-related murders are also horrible in South Africa. But what's more concerning about farm murders is the fact that it's a crime phenomenon that is being being romanticized by the ruling party. Um, they, you know, we, we, I mean, we've said this many times in terms of the songs they sing, in terms of the political speeches they make. I've never heard a politician in South Africa or anywhere in the world sing about killing rhinos or sing about, um, you know, beating up women and children or singing about uh, gang related, you know, um, you know, being mem a member of one gang and murdering people who aren't a supporter of your gang or or whatever, or, or a romanticizing copper cable theft. I mean, the list goes on. But when it comes to farm attacks, that's the reality is, is people keep singing these songs, but it's not only the songs, it, it's the speeches. It's the speeches in which White farmers in particular are continuously labeled land thieves and criminals. Uh, Julius Malema, when he, was, when he was still president of the ANC Youth League, um, made a speech at, at a political rally in front of the state president when he said white people are, all white people are criminals and they should be treated as such. He said that in front of the state president at a political rally, the president didn't even blink an eye. Um, so that's why people are so concerned about this. But, but then on top of that, you have to combine that with all the other discriminatory realities in South Africa, which includes um, comments, uh, the comment by, by President Cyril Ramaphosa that uh, the, the ANC, he said that in the early 90s, that the ANC intends to deal with white people like boiling a frog alive. In other words, you know, you raise the temperature yeah. slowly. Um, and, 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 you know, we have black empowerment, these racial, we have more than, a, there was a study done by, by James Myberg from Politics Web, who found more than 84 um, laws and, and policies that discriminate against uh, minorities on a racial basis in South Africa. Um, and the list goes on. Um, um, so, so that's why people are so angry, because they are continuously treated like, like second-class citizens. And the South African government, the ruling party, simply, simply do not care. As a matter of fact, it's not, it would be inaccurate to say they do not care, because it's something that they actively encourage. And that's that's the problem that we are facing. No, absolutely. And it's uh, I remember the hearing that the police brigadier completely detached from reality after 26 years, but especially after the last two decades. Uh, the last 20 years have been especially horrific. And, and listening to him say, I don't understand what they are upset about. Almost like saying those people, you know, that kind of the bigotry and racism comes in with that phrase. But yeah. he's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, he almost said those people. But he said, I don't understand what they are upset about. We caught the perpetrators. We're upset because a 21-year-old man who was born after apartheid was over was not even a farm owner. He was a farm manager, and he was murdered. And he wasn't just murdered. He was tortured brutally. Why? And why Why are you happy that you caught the perpetrators? Because as we see now, one of them has bail. One of them had two charges against him previously, two convictions. One had 16 convictions against him. Why are these people not in prison? Why are they walking the streets of South Africa? And it just, it, it, it beggars the imagination that a police official, no, it doesn't, because I know the context of South Africa, but I mean, now we're seeing this nonsense here in the States, but in, in the normal circumstances, one would just be like, I, I, I just be gobsmacked that a police official would think that when, for instance, yesterday, Chris Van Heerden, the uh, former IBO welterweight champion of the world from South Africa was on my program, and we talked about his father being murdered. And uh, the murderer claimed self-defense, even though he shot his father in the back. I don't know how you self-defend, you know, when you're shooting someone in the back. Uh, but he's out on $300 bail. Andre Pinar, who probably said some things he shouldn't have said, is charged with terrorism and with uh, attempting to murder a police officer whom he slapped. I don't know how you kill somebody by slapping them. That's pretty impressive. Uh, but Andre Pinar, in the Senate call the first time, seven police cars show up to arrest him. He's, he's denied bail. First off, they do it on a Friday, so he can't get a hearing. 
He's kept over the weekend, remanded. Then he, he's denied bail. Then eventually gets bail on a second appeal. But he's get 15,000 Rand bail, which is not a lot of money, but 15,000 Rand rail for essentially um, slapping a police officer and, you know, saying some rash things, uh, which, you know, it's, a, it's probably a legitimate charge, but I'm not going to get into that. But in the meantime, the person who is accused of torturing, stabbing multiple times, beating, tying Brendan Horner to a post and hanging him there. And I don't want to hear the nonsense from people. He wasn't hung. He was hung. His body slipped down. That person got bail of 5,000 Rand. This makes no sense whatsoever. Mm. It doesn't make sense. And, and, and that's the problem. Um, and then we have the, the, um, the brigadier saying he doesn't understand why people are angry because the perpetrators have been caught. Now, imagine if, I mean, the ANC, of course, they even started this anti-racism campaign after the death of, of George Floyd in, in, in the USA. Imagine if someone, or imagine them saying, why are the people are so angry about George Floyd? Because the people who were involved there have already been caught. Um, uh, and and that, that goes to the double standards that we see in South Africa. There's a, there's a, certain, there's a certain threshold um, that count for one section of society, and there's a different one that counts for a different section. And it's not even it's not even a secret. It's something that they actively they publicly speak about. Um, president Jacob Zuma, of the former state president, when he was president, he spoke in parliament, and he said his exact words were, were "We have more rights because we are the majority. You have less rights because you are the minority." Absolutely, that is how democracy works. And now people, you know, some of some people in the media immediately rush to his defense and say, no, he didn't mean it that way. He actually meant something different. Uh, and we shouldn't. That's not necessarily the ruling party's view. But you can compare that to other comments by other senior members of the ruling party who say the same thing. Uh, Palo Jordan has always been regarded as one of the intellectual leaders of the ruling party, especially the, the sort of the previous generation. In the early 90s, during the negotiation for a new South Africa, he said, that he recognizes or the ANC recognizes that self-determination um, for minorities and minority rights are important and it's something that should be respected and recognized but it's not something that the ANC will recognize because for them uh, minority rights is simply a continuation of apartheid so so that's what Paula Jordan said and even more recently um, um, Zizi Kodwa who uh, at the time was spokesperson for for the ANC um, I believe he's currently spokesperson for President uh, Ramaphosa, although you know because of cadre deployment they change so frequently. But um, recently, more recently at least, there was a a, a riot in in El Dorado Park in near Johannesburg with a coloured community that or a, a mixed race community, I think as they are called, or uh, or biracial, you know, whatever term you want to use, in in uh, who were who were frustrated about some issues at a school. And, and, you know, they were burning stuff and um, setting things on fire out of outrage. And then uh, the spokesperson came and said it's important for this community. It's important that this community should not feel as if they have been reduced to the status of a minority group. So what is he actually saying by that? He's saying that minority groups have a reduced status. He admitted, and this community, he admitted it. <laughs> Yeah, and and this this community who are at least half black, according to their you know line of reasoning, shouldn't feel as if they've been reduced to to this status of a minority group. That's that's the problem in South Africa, um, and that's the frustration, and that's the frustration that was expressed at at um, at Sienekal. So, Afro Forum's position is we don't encourage mob justice, we don't encourage people taking the law into their own hands, but but. But there's a, you cannot simply say, we do not understand why the people are so angry if you do not look at the bigger picture. Well, not, not encouraging violence. That's a stark contrast to the political party, actually the domestic terrorist group masquerading as a political party known as the Economic Freedom Fighters. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I need to address something in the chat here very quickly, Ernst. Anna said yeah. that um, he was not tortured. It was not about race. You ignore what the farmer said. I didn't ignore what any farmer said. Uh, you're the one introducing race. I don't recall mentioning that Brendan Horner was a white guy and that's why he was murdered. Uh, you've introduced race in the conversation, not me. 
And then Anna also said that that person, uh, 2,000 Rand paid, he has nothing. 5,000 is, is more than 15,000 for middle-class white person. Well, I submit to you, Anna, that that's racist and bigoted. Um, to make the assumption that white people have money when plenty of white people don't. I grew up without electricity, without plumbing, fetch water from a cistern, use an outdoor privy, which we call an outhouse here in the States. To make the assumption that because of some skin pigmentation, they have resources is just unjust. And it really isn't about that. That's a moral equivalency. That's something that a leftist would do. You'd fit right in here in the States, Anna. Right here in the States, you'd be perfect with the Black Lives Matter and Antifa, the domestic terrorist organization. Uh, doing this, this moral equivalency. It doesn't matter what someone has for resources. It matters the gravity of the crime. The gravity of the crime is what bail should be set upon. Then the secondary condition should be whether someone is able to pay based on whether it's a less severe crime. But uh, I'm sorry, that moral equivalency doesn't fly here on Chris White Africa. But uh, thank you for contributing, and you're welcome to stay and enjoy the rest of the conversation. Sorry, Aaron, I felt it was necessary to address that. I didn't raise race. Uh, this, this person did. And I didn't raise this uh, false equivalency about, well, you know, Andre Pinar can't afford it. The other guy can't. Well, while we're at it, Andre Pinar is a convicted criminal. He served three years in jail. Is that relevant? Nope, not germane either. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along, Ernst. <laughs> um, well, maybe to add to, to, to that, um, I had an interview with a journalist from the Sunday Times who called me after what happened at Cynical. And, um, you know, he was furious about, you know, these you know, racist white people and, and, and whatever and, and, and how angry they were and it's not justifiable. <laughs> and, and then he asked me a a question that I don't think he realized how silly the question actually was. He, he's, he asked me, what kind of a person thinks that you can make a political point by overturning a police vehicle? And of course, he was referring to the white people at Cynical. And I said to him, the, the kind of person who votes ANC uh, believes that you can you make a political point by t overturning a vehicle or setting something on fire. And the problem that we have in this country is that type of behavior is and has been um, rewarded for years. Uh, if someone feels that they, they don't get their point across, what they do is they, they burn down a school or they burn down a library or they set a vehicle on fire or they, they throw stones through a school's uh, classroom windows or a university or whatever. And then suddenly they get all the attention they want and they get, the, the, um, they get what they want. That's, what, that's the reality in South Africa. It's what, what's happening on universities. It's what's happening on a, on a national level. Um, it started probably with this uh, fees must fall and roads must fall campaigns where the people started. It started with some guy defecating on, on the statue of Cecil John Rhodes at the university that was built by the money left by Cecil John Rhodes. Um, and I'm not a Cecil John Rhodes fan at all, but... This is a university built by Cecil John Rhodes, and then people were, you know, demanding the statue to be taken down because they said they can't breathe if there's the statue of him. Um, and 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 that type of behavior is rewarded. And I remember after that, then the, this this riot, this national movement started, where people started burning statues and setting it on fire. And we've seen it in the USA as well. And they get they get their cues from the USA, of course. Um, and then there was this there was this meeting hosted by the the Department of Arts and Culture about heritage in South Africa, and the members of this movement uh, who actively encouraged murder. They would make speeches about murdering white people and things like that. Um, um, there was a, a meeting hosted by the Department of Arts and Culture, and they saw these members of this movement there, and they asked them to stand up so that everyone can applaud them. Um, and I mean, it, we've seen this movie over and over in South Africa. Um, but but to get back to this interview I had with the Sunday Times, and so I, I pointed out to this this journalist, it's a term that was coined actually by a speechwriter of of George W. Bush, and it was first used by, by um, the soft bigotry of low expectations. And I, I asked him if he recognizes. That um, that what he's doing currently is an expression of of anti-black racism, and he asked me why am I saying this, and I said to him because what he's saying is that if 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 in South Africa if we have the EFF or some movement like that rioting and vandalizing stores, um, it's just regarded as you know that's just how these people act. Um, that's that's the perception in South Africa. But when it's white people. Then it's condemned. Then we have the Department of Justice, the Department of Agriculture, the, the provincial department, 
the ruling party, all issuing press statements. We have the, pre the state president condemning it. So when it's white people doing this type of things, it's, it's condemned universally. But when it's black people, it isn't. And, and that's an expression of, of, of anti-black racism, because what you are effectively saying is that you have, a, you have a low standard for black people and you have a high standard for white people. And if black people don't comply, but it's black people, it's easy for black people to comply to your standard because it's very low. Uh, but white people, you know, we should measure them by a different standard. And that's 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 just plain racism. And it's something that shouldn't be tolerated. But it's what we see all the time in South Africa. No, absolutely. Well, it's uh, no, this is not, not to feel your pain or anything, but just to see how stupid things get uh, here in the United States. Um, I've listened for years that it's it's not right. I, I have no role models. There's. There's no, there's no black people on television. And I, my entire life, I grew up with one uh, television show that was overwhelmingly black cast after another, one after another. But, but to hear that story, so just to anecdotal here, um, I live in an area that's uh, just by happenstance happens to be over 90% white in this county and uh, in a state that's overwhelmingly white. Uh, but um, my television channels, when I turn them on, uh, 75 to 90% of all the people appearing in all the television commercials now are people of color. Um, mostly black, uh, some mixed race, uh, a few Asians here and there, mm. but there's no Asians within 50 miles of where I live, although we have lots of Asians in America. So, so this nonsense about that. But the thing that always disturbed me about that is that when I was a young man, I was inspired by Martin Luther King. I looked up to him. Um, he doesn't look like me. I mean, I guess I'm not allowed to do that. I think you get the, the fallacy of the logic that they come up with here. It's just crazy with people who play these race games back and forth. So uh, there's been a few comments uh, in, in the comment section there, but I want to get to a couple other things. So you were talking about Black Lives Matter, and, and a lot of this is virtue signaling and empty nonsense. We saw, for instance, um, as you mentioned, the ANC came out with this. Every Friday is Black Lives, or Black Friday now for Black Lives Matter. They, they tried that uh, after the lockdown started. Of course, that was after the security services, both SAPS and Sandev, killed 11 or 12 black South Africans in the townships. And then, of course, they started getting a lot of bad press, so they pulled away from that, and it pretty much let the townships run crazy. Uh, but it's just empty virtue signaling. Um, I'm sure you see this every day, this, this silly virtue signaling. Are you there? Ernst? Uh, sorry, I, I, I seem to have lost you for a second. Just repeat the, the, the question. I lost the last part of it. No, that's all right. Your connection's a little I rough. I can there. hear you. Can okay. You? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, I was just saying that um, well, the ANC started this virtue signaling after killing about 11 or 12 black South Africans in the townships with the security services in the overly zealous yeah. lockdown when it started back in late March, early April. So they pulled out of the townships and just let people do what they wanted to do because they didn't want the bad press. And then they started this virtue signaling every Friday's Black Friday. That didn't last very long. Uh, and it was at the height of hypocrisy to say that Black Lives Matter when the security services in South Africa are murdering uh, black South Africans. Mm, not good. Maybe you should stop. Mm. stop well, the, exactly. Stop and, and so, President Ramaphosa had. Uh, sorry? No, I was saying maybe you should stop the video on your YouTube on the computer. You can still watch the Zoom and then that'll stop eating some of your bandwidth. Um, and then uh, you can hear you better and see you. No, no, I'm, I'm not on Zoom. Don't All stop. Right. Yeah, don't I'll stop, stop on, the video. Don't stop the video on Zoom. Stop it on because you're watching. I think you're watching the stream. Oh, so uh, uh, yeah, you can. You, you'll still get the chat if you stop the video, and it'll stop yeah, loading. I video. just, uh, I believe I closed it on YouTube. Let me just uh, check. If okay. It's... Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. No. If 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 your bandwidth connection is low, you can stop the video. The chat will still yeah. flow through, and you can watch the chat. Anyway, I think that's better. We got a little bit better connection. Anyway, no, I was just talking about the hypocrisy of the virtue signal, the empty virtue signal that the ANC has been doing, and they do it all the time. It's and, and just to add to that, now that you're back, we've got you. It's, uh, you know, I find it ludicrous. You know, you have the head of the state. You talk about ANC senior figures. I mean, just a few weeks back, the president of South Africa was talking about the nature of white people is that they're racist. And this is why we have gender-based violence. That was his response to gender-based violence in South Africa, that white people are racist. So I think that, that small white toddlers running around are responsible for other South African men raping and murdering their partners and spouses. Uh -huh. Not looking good on your connection there. And the rant, the red ants hit your house. Yeah. Maybe you should just stop the video and we'll just do the audio then for a little bit and see how that goes.
Folks, apologize for this. We're having some connection problems. I don't know if we blame on telecom or cell C or whoever is ISP is there in South Africa, but Ernst is uh, frozen at the moment. Uh, Ernst, if you can hear me, my recommendation now is just to turn off your video as well and just leave the audio on so we can hear you. Folks, uh, my special feature guest today on this Monday, the 2nd of November, which by the way is the date that I entered the army in 1983, 2nd of November, it's a date I never forget. Always remember that. I was quite excited to be going to the army. Whoops, he's dropped off. Give me a second here. Uh, there we go. All right, sorry about that. So hopefully we'll get him back here in just a moment. But you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Adaba Africa channel. Thank you all so much for tuning in. My special feature guest is Ernst Ritz, uh, who's coming back now and probably just audio. Okay. Are you there, Ernst? I can hear you. Sorry about that. I don't know what's wrong with that. I'm supposed to have a, a proper connection, but for some reason we're having trouble today. Well, I'm sure it's the red ants. They're probably outside digging up your cable connection as we speak. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, um, anyway, can you hear me? Can I go ahead? Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you're back. Okay, there he is. I can see you now. Wonderful. I can see you as well. <laughs> um, no, what I was saying is, is um, President Ramaphosa seems to have more to say about And then Colin Scorza, who was killed in South Africa by security forces during this this uh, state of, of disaster, um, economic lockdown. And, and it's because it suits their ideological and political narrative. And it doesn't suit their narrative to talk about to talk about black people who they kill themselves. Um, and, and that's a problem. That's that's um, again, it goes to the double standards. But I think it's to call it double standards is is also not to read. Because it's not simply a government that's trying its best, but incidentally, it also has double standards. It's a it's it's a nationalist socialist movement. That's how they describe themselves. Um, that has a very clear ideological, and you can you can add to that cultural agenda. And what I mean by cultural agenda is, or you can call it an ethnic agenda. They have a particular agenda with regard to to black people particular agenda with regard to white people. And they have this ideological agenda about pushing for what they call the National Democratic Revolution, which basically means that you have to use democracy to, to promote or to, a, to, to, um, to enable or push for a socialist revolution, to make the country a socialist state through democracy and through so-called democratic institutions. And, and for them, it's not about... For, for them, it's about about discriminating against minorities um it's it's the same way i mean we've seen it um, in many examples in the world um it's it's not about democracy these people aren't democrats uh they aren't liberals they aren't conservatives they are outspoken socialists who believe people like like um robert mugabe people like hugo Chavez and nicolas maduro people like like joseph stalin and vladimir lenin um, they believe that these people are heroes. Not only, do, and, and I'm not speculating. They they say this. They say that they regard these people as heroes. They even went as far as trying to rename one of the main streets in Pretoria after Mao Zedong. And when they were questioned about that, when one of the opposition parties said to them, "Do you know who Mao Zedong was? Do you know what Mao Zedong did?" They said, "Yes, but we must remember he was never found guilty of any crime." Um, so <laughs> the fact that he wasn't—I mean, he was the dictator. Of course, he wasn't found guilty of any crime. And then 20, they also 20 million rest. people killed during the Cultural Revolution, executed. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and he had that, um, what was the name of the campaign? I think 100 Flowers Blooming campaign or something, where you could, you could write to the government, to the Socialist Party, and you could criticize them. You could, you could, you could um, make suggestions on how the Chinese government or the Communist Party could govern better. And people were encouraged to write to them. And then what they did was they took all the people who criticized the government and they went out and they killed them. That's and I mean that's just one example of what Mao did. I mean, not uh, to say tens of thousands of people were killed is an understatement. To say hundreds of thousands were killed is an understatement. And then the ANC said no, but he was never found guilty of anything. Um, so we can venerate him. We can name a street after him. And they then said something that I think is even more significant. They said we as the ANC have Mao Zedong to thank 
for the good relationship that the ruling party, the ANC in South Africa, currently still has with the Communist Party of China. Um, and, and I think that's a very significant, very important statement. And it's something that, that we should remind people of. But I mean, I can also add that fortunately, they didn't push through with that. I think they underestimated the backlash that they would get for naming a street after Mao Zedong. But there are many other examples. There, there was this idea to change the two streets in which the US embassy is based in Pretoria. It's between Pretoria and Skuman streets that that's what they were named before they were uh, well, one's, changed. One's already changed. Skuman is now Francis Bard, has been for several yes, years. Yes, that's it. Yes. Um, but they actually wanted to change the street to uh, to Fidel Castro Street. So they wanted to change the street in which the U.S. Embassy is based uh, to rename it after Fidel Castro. Um, and that's the type of things. I mean, we've had Cyril Ramaphosa go on to, into Washington and during a um, in Washington, D.C., endorse Chinese uh, policies, saying endorsing Huawei, for example. Uh, we've had them say, you know, this whole thing about Huawei and 5G, it's just... The USA is just jealous of, of of China. That's that's why they're so you know concerned about about uh, what China is doing with Huawei. We have these type of comments, um, and and I think people shouldn't think people shouldn't think that the ruling party in South Africa is a democratic government that has the the interest of the people at heart. It's and th again, th this isn't speculating. You can simply go out and read their policy documents. You can read what they publish on their own websites. You can listen to their speeches. You can you can read their press statements, and you would you wouldn't do a lot of reading before you you find out who who and what this movement really is. No, absolutely. You know, it's uh, it's comical, and <laughs> knowing a little something about Huawei and what's going on there, uh, trust me, it's uh, I'm sure you know the answer. It's not it's not jealousy. Um, Huawei stole industrial secrets from Ericsson, from Nokia, from the United States, uh, and that's how they're able to field a 5G network in the first place. And then they've contorted yeah. it for their needs. So uh, not jealous. We have our own 5G networks. It's funny how the world's not talking about anyone else. All they're talking about is Huawei as if they're the only ones to field 5G. Or the first, they're not. Uh, we have 5G networks here in the States now and have had for a year. But no one's talking about that because the focus on China. It's very interesting how um, inept country like that can win the strategic communications battle. Century communications, I think you'd appreciate that. China is winning the strategic communications battle. And I don't see how because they're not very adept at it. I think it's by default. You know, it's amazing. America is the country that invented the uh, satellite news systems, 24-hour news, cable systems, Hollywood, the movie industry, television. It all came from America. And our government is abysmal at strategic communications. I do a better job, I'm, I'm not boasting, but I do a better job communicating what our national interests are than Washington does. And that's just sad. <laughs> I would like to add to that because I agree with you. And I've, I've said this to people in Washington earlier this year. I mean, we're there to garner support, but in some cases, people ask us for, for our opinion and we give them our opinion. And especially talking about China and Washington. And I think the single most important thing um, in terms of what China and what the US is doing differently, and I think why China is at least to a certain extent winning, is China has a, a coherent message that is communicated frequently and consistently and it's hard if you're not in the U.S. or if you are in the U.S. as well to 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 really flesh out what is the U.S.'s position on China and what is the U.S.'s position on 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 on, on some of these issues. And I think that's some some. I mean, of course, I mean, we regard our, as as Afrikaners, we regard ourselves as Africans and as but also as Westerners and people, especially Afrikaners, but a lot of people in South Africa look to the USA, you know, as the leader of the free world and all of that. But I think there's some some criticism to to the the establishment in in, in Washington. Uh, if you ask my opinion on that, I'll, I'll tell you. And I think it's that I don't I don't see a coherent message. I think there's too much disagreements and debating and, and you don't really get a, a consistent message coming from Washington about about China and about what's happening in the world at the moment. And I'm not talking about the White House. I'm talking about the because I think Trump has a has a strong message, but but I, if you look at the establishment, you hear people saying speaking in opposites, and I, I, it's a concern, and I think it's something that the U.S. should 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 uh, focus on. Well, I agree absolutely. It's uh, having lived it, you know, and worked in eight embassies in Africa, and and it's uh, it's it's one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing at times, and then sometimes it's the deep state desires 
It's why I found comical. Some Liberian American was granted ink uh, in the New York Times uh, within uh, three months of Trump taking office. And she wrote this fictitious fairy tale about Trump has cut foreign assistance in half by 60 percent or something like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, the budget is a matter of law. Trump can't ch Trump can't shut any or he can't cut anything. He's been president for 90 days. This budget continues for this year. Nothing's been done. And I wrote a rebuttal to New York Times. And of course, they didn't bother to carry it. But um, that, that's just it's just crazy stuff. Let me take care of a couple super chats here real quick, Aaron. And then uh, there's, there's, sure. and then Caesar has like 37,000 questions. So I'm not going to get to all your questions, Caesar, but we'll get to a couple <laughs> of them. So uh, Flying Boar, um, who's an Indian in Canada, uh, says, uh, Ernst came to America two years ago, appeared on Fox News. Yep, saw you on Tucker Carlson. Uh, did he get to meet White House officials or Congress? You did meet some people. I think you met a couple senators. I don't know. Are you able to share, uh, not necessarily who you met with, but, but the level of officials you met with on that trip? Yes, yes we met with a, a variety of people, um, people in the House and the Senate, um, who are especially, we focus especially on, on people who are members of the foreign affairs committees, uh, but not exclusively. Um, so we've spoken with quite a few people and sometimes you don't get to the, to the actual senator, but you get to the chief of staff uh, or some, something like that. And we, spoke, we also speak with Republicans and Democrats. Um, so we spoke with them. Uh, we had, we've spoken with many think tanks. Um, and I think people who aren't in the U.S. or who don't follow American politics can easily underestimate the role that think tanks play uh, because it's sort of a foreign concept to people in South Africa. We, we have some think tanks in South Africa. We have the IRR and we have um, the Free Market Foundation and, and, and the Center for Development of Enterprise and so forth. But think tanks are very influential in, in, in the U.S., especially in terms of advising senators and Congress people and so forth. So we spoke with a bunch of them and, and obviously people in the media. And we spoke with not the White House, but with the State Department. Uh, we've had a few meetings, actually, with, with the State Department, um, meetings that I would regard as successful meetings. We met with um, John Bolton, <laughs> uh, and that caused quite an uproar in South Africa. Um, and we've been, we've been, you know, honest about that from the start. We, we didn't have a meeting with him, so to, we... we we, we, we literally bumped into him in the green room at Fox News and we were waiting for my interview and John Bolton was waiting for a different interview. So we walked up to him and said, hey, we'd like to introduce ourselves. Um, we're from Afri Forum. We know who you are. And we gave him a copy of, of my book, Kill the Boer. And uh, we had a, probably a 30 seconds conversation. And he, he said that he's aware of what's happening in terms of the farm murders in South Africa. And he took the book and we took a picture with him. Um, and then, you know, that started the conspiracy theories about who did Africa meet with and who didn't we meet with. Um, but but we are we've had some very good meetings, um, I think, especially with the State Department, as I've mentioned, and people in the House and the Senate. And but there's a lot more that has to be done. We, we've spoken with USAID, USAID, I think, as, as it's usually referred to um, um, about, um, you know, you know, the extent to which they are involved in South Africa. And, and a variety of others. Um, so we've had quite a, we, we have quite a network in Washington, but and we've 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 received quite a or achieved quite a bit of success to date um, in terms of getting publicity to what's happening in South Africa, uh, getting people to pay attention to the problem. But there's still a lot that has to be done. I think what we would like to achieve, um, and I think what what the U.S. should do or can do to help is at least to pass a motion. Uh, through uh, either the House or the Senate or both, uh, through the Foreign Affairs Committees, at least to say we are concerned about what is happening in South Africa um, and we have to monitor this and, and, and see what happens um, because South Africa is running the risk of, of violating um, the AGOA agreement. It not only running the risk, it's actually already oh, violated. It's already, no, no, I'm already calling for South Africa's suspension under the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. The, the, mere, yeah. the mere introduction of an expropriation without compensation bill into the parliament is a violation, in my view. I'm not an attorney of certainly the spirit, not if not the right. law. Yeah, so, so South Africa should be suspended, and um, you should not be able to send uh, your $10 billion worth of goods to the United States without duty, as of right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, because because the agreement, I mean, it's a trade agreement, and the agreement says that the parties to the agreement have to protect property rights. And it also says the parties have to, not only not only should there be a free market in that country, but it must increasingly, the, the market, it, it must increasingly promote a free market. So the market must become freer 
not more restricted. So, so that's I think in a in a sense you're right. You say and simply passing a motion of expropriation without compensation in Parliament is already a violation of that that agreement. Well, and, um, and, so and, what, and Aaron, if I can, sorry to interrupt you there, I, I don't like to do my guess very right. often, but this is an important point, and I'm going to get your take on this because I don't want to forget this conversation. I have been telling people since this nonsense was introduced in 2017 or 2018 that um, this is not about farmland. It is about farmland, but it's not exclusively about farmland. This is a bill that will be used by the party in power of the day as a political cudgel to intimidate anyone who dares speak out against the government. Oh, you want to speak out against uh, our party ABC? Well, guess what? Um, we're going to take your checking accounts. We're going to take your Bucky. We're going to take your SUV, your, your Q7. We're going to take your retirement accounts. Oh, okay, never mind. I don't have anything to say. It will be used as a tool of intimidation and also be used to pill for people's wealth, but it will also be used anytime anybody says anything against the government. It will silence opposition because you'll be penniless and in prison. And that's 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 my concern. It is about farmland, but it is about much more than that because you already have expropriation without comp with with compensation in Article Twenty Five of the Constitution. But you know, if you want to take somebody's money, it doesn't work out well because if you take a million rand from them, you have to compensate them. What's the compensation? A million rand. You can take land uh, for you know what we call eminent domain here uh, for in the interest of the state, but then you've got to compensate. So it's a little bit different. But uh, expropriation without compensation to me is all about political power and tyranny. Are you still there? All right, now the red answer really there. We, we said something out of bounds. <laughs> Aaron says, at frozen at the moment. We'll give him a chance to come back here, folks. Let me get back to that. Yeah, I'm having a bit of trouble in his connection on his side, so I don't know how much of that he heard. But let me get to the Super Chats. Uh, Aaron's, oh, that's a question for Aaron's from Sylvester Stalline. I'll have to get back to that one. And then the previous one was um, Flying Board. The ANC wants to change the name of the street by U.S. Embassy. The USA should do the same. The South African Embassy change the street to Henry. <laughs> uh, Aaron, stop. Sorry, you're just getting back there. But uh, Flying Board sent a cheeky super chat. He said, if the ANC wants to change the name of the street in front of the U.S. Embassy in Hatfield, then the U.S. should change the name of the street in the U.S. Embassy or the, the South African Embassy in D.C. and call it Hendrik Fevert. I don't know if we want to do that. That's probably... <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty clever. <laughs> yeah, that is that is that's clever and a bit cheeky. But I don't know how, how much did you hear about my comment about expropriation? Did you, what was no, no, I got, I think I got the the gist of it, and I think you're right. And um, and it's important to state this: this is not simply about farmland. They, they are using farmland as an argument. Um, but what they are doing, you can read the motion. It doesn't say expropriate farms or farmland. It says expropriate property. Property. Expropriate private property. Um, so at the moment, there's, there's no talk in South Africa about expropriating people's cars and laptops and things like that. But I think what people need to understand, it's that old metaphor uh, Winston Churchill spoke about feeding the crocodile. Um, so, so this is, they don't want to, the plan or the strategy isn't just to bash the door open and just to grab everything they want. It's, it's a gradual thing. That's why they call it a national democratic revolution. Um, so it's it's a gradual thing to to change the constitution, to change the property rights clause, to say, listen, you don't, you don't need to worry. We're going to do this very responsibly. We're not going to do the same thing that happened in Zimbabwe. There are going to be some some checks and balances in place, and and there's going to be some some prerequisites or requirements or conditions under which we're going to do this. But the state must have the power to expropriate people's private property without compensation, in principle. And then a lot of people fall for this. They, especially, you know, commentators in the media, they say, "Why are you so angry?" Because they've said that they're going to do this responsibly. They said that they are going to do this in a way that would boost the economy, not hurt the economy. And we always joke about that. We say that's like saying that we're going to expand aggressively expand KFC, but no chickens are going to be harmed in in the process. <laughs> um, so, so that's the. the that's the reality is it's not it's not simply about farmland it's about property and it's not only about property it's about a an openly marxist leninist movement that that boasts about their marxist roots and their marxist philosophies and and ideology um that has a problem with with all forms of inequality um they 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 want to entrench or enforce equality of outcome in other words everyone must reach the fin finishing line at the same same moment regardless of how fast you you are regardless of whether you prepared for the race regardless of of any other factor regardless of whether you you actually prepared or whether you're a hard worker or you aren't um uh, we must all reach the finishing line at the end of the, the the day and it's this typical communist utopia this thing that 
I, well, I can't remember if it was Marx or Lenin. I think it was Lenin. I think it was Marx who wrote about people sitting under the tree next to the river one day when this utopia has arrived. And and they use this terminology. President Cyril Ramaphosa himself said that expro- and he linked it to expropriation of private property without compensation when he said that that it's going to the 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 ANC is going to create the Garden of Eden in South Africa through expropriation of private property without compensation. And he said, we can create the ultimate paradise. Those were his words in South Africa by taking people's stuff. Um, and, and that's how detached they are from, from reality. Um, and I, I think that's the, that's the concern here. And, and I mean, we can talk about how detached they really are from reality. One of the, the, the worst examples, um, I mentioned this in an interview the other day as well, was, was the, the ambassador to Venezuela who said, about, I believe it was last year, who said that uh, during a speech in Venezuela, of course, he was supporting Maduro and, 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 and the Venezuelan government. And he said the South African government, he railed against the USA. He then said the South African government is prepared to take up arms and, and send soldiers to fight the USA. I mean, how, how detached from reality do you have to be to think that with the South African army as it is, the South African defense force, you can not only declare war against the USA, but actually send your troops to the USA to, to fight them over there. That's that's how detached they are from reality. Well, and it's listen, very it's, it's very funny, but it's also very sad. Well, it's it's it wouldn't be any trouble at all. I mean, they simply board SAA flights and come to Miami. So, oh wait, <laughs> wait, there is no South African Airways. It's it's in business rescue. The euphemism for bankruptcy. Again, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, a couple of points, real quick, to talk about how it. You know, it, it, obviously, I'm not going to deny there are a, a, a whole passel load of racist in the economic freedom fighters, and increasingly more and more racist making their face shown in the African National Congress, which is really sad, uh, really sad. But but uh, I'm not saying all the people in the ANC are certainly not, but there are enough of them. But but there's two things that make this pretty clear that this is you know it's more than race; it's about control and power. And number one is that. First off, the uh, the department responsible for lands has been habitually underfunded by the ANC while they've pilfered money from the arms deal that was supposed to be 4.6 billion US dollars wound up being 7.1 billion dollars. What are those Grippens doing now? Sitting on the ground being flown by contract pilots? What are those Hawk lead and fighter trainers doing? Those Type 209 diesel submarines? Why in God's name did South Africa need diesel submarines to protect them against Botswana in the Okavango? Is that what they're for? Or cruisers? And so all that money. And what about uh, in Kanla and Oilgate and Travelgate? And we can just go on and on and on. The yeah. state capture, the theft, the trillions of rand now that have probably been pilfered from South Africa's economy. Where has it gone? Money that could have been used to resolve the few re- few legitimately remaining uh, land cases from the original window, which is 1995 to 99, when 75,000 cases were filed for restitution, 74,000 have been resolved. Uh, there's about a thousand left, and then the fraudulent window, which Jacob Zuma opened up, which opened a can of worms of 141,000 additional land claims, most of which are fraudulent, and it's really clogging the system up. But the government has never taken the issue of land seriously. It's just it's it's a red herring. They have thousands of hectares in their hands. They provide no credit, no no extension services, no advice for new farmers, nothing. It's all red herring. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is I don't know if you saw this, Aaron, but um, I don't know if you're a netball follower. I I find it amusing. It's not really a sport I enjoy, but but the Mpumalanga Sunbirds won the other day, 43 to 42 against the uh, the Queens. And congratulations to the, oh, wait, wait, no, no. They lost the game because they um, they violated transformation uh, rules. Yeah. So the, uh, the, uh, the Telecom Netball League requires that they have a balance of players, white and black, on the, t- on the team. And so what happened was, um, I'm sure a lot of people are like, oh, here we go again. I'm, I'm sick of this. Springboks, too many white players. Nah, nah, you're wrong. Too many black players were playing on the team. So for one little period, in, in one little spot in the second period, they had six black players on the court and just one white player. And so for that, they had 43 points taken away from them. They forfeited the division semifinal and didn't go to the final. Now that matters because the white and black players on that netball team are competing for attention for professional leagues in Australia and in the United Kingdom so they can have a career and make money and, and do something as a professional athlete. So now a team that didn't win advances and these other players don't get any attention over the idiocy of this transformation. So that that's not a, you know, this is a case where technically whites were discriminated against because not enough white girls were on the court. How stupid is this? I mean, this is this is the world that you all live in. It must drive you insane. Yeah, it's, and it's crazy and it just goes on and on. I know I know Solidarity, the, the trade union of uh, that is linked to, that's affiliated to AfriForum, 
have been in many court cases involved with, with black empowerment and affirmative, affirmative action. Um, at least they call it black empowerment. It's, it's rather a policy of black dependency. It, it makes black people dependent on the South African government. But they've had these crazy cases where um, I remember one case where an Indian, they, they couldn't, I think they couldn't make an appointment because according to the policy, they had to appoint, they only had room for half an Indian and they, they couldn't find half an Indian to, to appoint. Uh, and there was another case where they, they um, you know, they, 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 they had to explain why this, this uh, position is left vacant. And then they had this immensely complicated calculation with mathematical equations in terms of how the racial uh, composition should be. And, and there's only, there's only there's, if you count the amount of positions that are available, and if you look at the demographics, it means that there's only room for 0.2% people of this, this race and so forth. Um, and, and, and then they, you know, they just leave it vacant because they don't know who to appoint. But the fact of the matter is with that netball team, it shouldn't be a problem if the entire team is black, if those people are there on merit. If the best players are black, they should be on the team. And that's, again, that's part of the, the double standards in South Africa. Is, there's been many cases in South Africa where Bafana Bafana, where the soccer team was completely black um, and it wasn't an issue. It was a 100% black team and people supported them because they were the best players. But now we have this whole issue, of course, with the Springbok team all the time. And sometimes it's not an issue if all the players are black and then they would defend it. They would say, no, because of the history of discrimination, if the entire team is black, it doesn't matter. Uh, so there's only a threshold for white people, not for black people. And then sometimes, as we had now with this netball uh, incident, uh, it's it's a problem. So I, they don't even know how to apply their own um, policies um, uh, and, and it just goes to how ludicrous the situation is. And what makes it even more crazy is, is the, the Population Registration Act um, of, when, what was it, 1952 or something, was, was repealed because it's said to be, it's racist. The, because the Population Act literally was the piece of legislation in South Africa that was used to categorize people according to their skin. So it said on your ID document or your passport or whatever, it said you are a white person or you are black or you are Indian or... or or whatever. Um, and then they, well, the new government came and they said, that's racist, we can't do that. So they, they repealed that act, but they still keep applying it. So legally in South Africa, there is no law in South Africa that categorizes you. So if someone says to me, I'm, I'm white, I can legally challenge them on that and say, How, according to what definition do you define me as white? According to what law? And now we have laws that discriminate against people based on the color of their skin, but we don't have laws that define the different races or that categorizes people according to the color of their skin because everyone agrees that that's racist. So, so it's this crazy situation that we have in South Africa. And, and, and this goes back to, and it's an important constitutional legal point of de facto versus de jure. De jure, it's crazy. I mean, and what I mean is just looking at the legislation, it doesn't make sense. But the de facto reality, in other words, what's happening in real life, it just doesn't care about whether the laws are, are, are stupid or whether the laws make sense or not, because they just they just steamroller their ideas over that. And, and that just says that de facto reality, there's an important political lesson to be learned from that. And that is that de facto carries more weight than de jure. What happens in real life carries more weight than, than, than whether the law makes sense or not. Crazy. Uh, we're coming up in just about an hour here, folks. Uh, Ernst, we've had some connection troubles and lost a little bit of time with you. I don't know if you're able to stay longer, if you have to cut out, but if, if you can stay a little bit longer, I can get a few chat questions in and we haven't even addressed sure. uh, case. Okay, great. So we'll get a few questions in here uh, from the chat. Um, Caesar, don't worry. I've seen all your questions. I've got about six of them stacked up. We're going to get to one or two. Sorry, not all of them. And I know you've <laughs> asked more than six. Uh, also, um, the, uh, I want to get to uh, the case that you guys, uh, you're appearing in court tomorrow, I believe. We'll get that in a moment. But let me go ahead and uh, get to some of the stuff from Caesar. And also, Yanni Meyer had a question earlier. So Caesar asked the question, uh, where's this one at? So um, AFRI Forum's mission to secure the Afrikaners' existence has sought international support. Have you sought international support? Has the Kingdom of the Netherlands been petitioned on behalf of the vulnerable Afrikaners? Um, I don't know that the basis of that question is correct. Is is AFRI Forum's mission to secure Afrikaners' existence? I think your existence, your purpose is minority rights. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. You have sought international support. You've traveled around the world, including the U.S. and other places. 
And I'm not sure why people would turn to the Netherlands because um, that I think that's based on a fallacy that Afrikaners are Dutch when actually that's the second largest percentage of your DNA. It's actually more German than Dutch. But anyway, so uh, can you unpack that and answer that in any way? <laughs> yes. So we, we have good relations with, with people in different governments and, and countries um, across the world. And we have good relations with especially some politicians in, in the Netherlands from different parties who are sympathetic to our cause. And we, we've had this motion that was passed in the Netherlands, I believe it was last year. Uh, but there's not, if the question is whether we are petitioning them to sort of export people, you know, back in quotation marks to the Netherlands, that's not, I mean, we want to create a future in South Africa um, uh, or, and in Africa. Um, so we don't want people to leave. A lot of people are leaving the country and we're very sad about that. And a lot of these people have good reasons to leave. But uh, if everyone just leaves, it also means that a culture will die. Um, so we want the culture to survive and to thrive. Um, and so our mission is to create a future uh, in South Africa, or at least in the, in the southern tip of Africa. Uh, that's uh, so. I just I just caught this here because I haven't seen him in the chat for a while. Uh, his father passed away recently. That's Johan Eisel, who is uh, South Africa's premier illusionist. He once made the Four Trekker monument disappear, and I hear that the ANC offered a ministerial post to him the next day. Only they found out it was an illusion. The Fort Trekker monument was still there, so they took it back. Anyway. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Johan says, uh, you guys are doing a great job. Thanks for sharing that, Johan. And then um, let's see. The, along the thread that you just brought out there just a moment ago. Uh, by the way, folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Adobe Africa channel. I'm Chris right here in central Pennsylvania. My special feature guest on a Monday is Ernst Ritz from Afriform, um, whom I – gave the wrong title to early because he's changed his title, but uh, he's responsible for communications there at Offered Forum these days. I think he was always responsible for that. But anyway, so there was a question here, kind of a follow-up to something you opened up a moment ago about immigration. So probably Neanderthal asked this question. I don't know that you have the answer. I have my estimate, but how many South Africans have emigrated since ANC rule over the last 26 years? I don't know if anybody has accurate figures, but I have my own estimation. There, there was a study a few years ago that estimated about half a million have left. Um, I don't think there's an, an accurate, up-to-date study about how many people have, have left. Uh, we know uh, it started spiking, ironically, after President Ramaphosa became president. Everyone thought he was going to be the big hope. He's going to save the country. Um, and then, you know, immediately after he started, we, start to, we started all this talk about expropriation without compensation. And he, he actually turned out to be much more ideologically radical than, than Jacob Zuma, than his sister. Um, so uh, there was a spike recently. I don't have, I don't think there are up to date numbers, but I do know that there was a study a few years ago that about half a million have left. Uh, there's a good question here from Jacques Vint. I'm not going to get to it at the moment. I'll get to it in a second because I'm trying to do these in order here. Um, thanks for sharing that, Aaron. Uh, yeah, my figure is a bit higher than that, to say the least. Uh, I think that's a gross underestimation. Um, just based on the number of South Africans in the United Kingdom alone um, exceed that, I'm uh, pretty sure. But uh, with Australia, New Zealand, the United States thrown in other places, I think it's a lot higher. But it, the, ba the bottom line is this, and here's the other thing. The, the nature of immigration hasn't been white Afrikaans speaking South Africans. There was a lot of people early on that that was the case. But uh, the majority of people leaving now seem to be black South Africans and coloreds. They're leaving in droves. Uh, anywhere they can get out of it, it's, it's pretty crazy. So um, there's a question here from Richard Lemma. Uh, Richard said, uh, please ask Ernst if Afri Forum can do an in-depth analysis of crimes committed between all races in South Africa. Uh, between all races, in other words, black on white, white on black, yeah. black on colored. Um, I know that the Institute for Security Studies does a great deal of research into crime in South Africa, and Johnny Steinberg has written a lot about it in the past. Um, uh, do, do you guys do anything about that or research it? Yes, um, we, we have spoken about that, and I would like to do an, a, a, an in-depth study on that. Part of the problem with that particular issue is South Africa, for some reason, and we, we can speculate what the reasons are, but they do not have accurate, the South African police does not have accurate details in terms of crime in a, a broken down in terms of race. In the USA, you can get that information fairly easily. Um, there aren't, there, there's been a few studies to, to calculate. I think there were four different studies um, to, to do, for example, a racial breakdown in terms of murder in South Africa, but you can't get that numbers from the police. In other words, they don't. They don't. Uh, I believe they 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 they, they uh, write it down in the dockets, but they don't release it. Uh, the statistics in terms of what was a percentage, what percentage of homicides, as they call it, or murders, are committed by white people as opposed to black people, as opposed to you know all the other racial groups, and what percentage of the victims are white as opposed to black, as opposed to all the others. 
that we don't have that statistics in South Africa. The closest we can get are, are estimates or studies based on uh, cal calculations based on dockets. People would study police dockets. They would take a few thousand and make a calculation. And as I said, there have been four such studies that I'm aware of or estimates, um, and they reach different conclusions. But uh, one thing that we are considering as AFRI Forum is to, to write to the police commissioner to ask for that detail to be released because it's written down in the docket. So at least to release what information they have. And we can use the Promotion of Access to Information Act in South Africa to, if you if you request information from a government institution um, that, and you can argue, especially that it's in the public interest and they don't want to give you that, uh, that information, you can use this act to force them to get a court order that the information has to be released. So we are considering that. Um, but but other, other than that, you have to work with the information or the studies that have been done or the estimates that have been done to date. All right, that's great. Uh, so I'm going to get to Caesar's question, one of his questions right now. <laughs> sure. Caesar's been very patient. Thank you for your patience, Caesar, uh, who contributes a lot on the chat here. Um, but before I do that, hey, what's the deal here? Um, is it all my regular subscribers? I mean, I don't see a lot of people subscribing during this chat. If you're new to the channel, you haven't been here, okay, take a second, smash that subscription button. And that will be the extent of my Ronaldo Jose e-begging for this stream. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ronaldo's not here, so we'll make sure he knows about that. But um, so Caesar asked this question. He said, uh, and it was a bit ago now. So he said, Afriform declares itself as a non-for-profit group. Membership has increased by over 200,000 between 2006 and 2019. What funding percentage has been allocated to counterterrorism? Um, before you answer that, um, I would I, I don't know how you're going to answer. I mean, you're not a, a group involved in counterterrorism fight. I mean, that's a government function. So um, I, I, I'm sure you may be awareness. I mean, I don't know. Do you, do you is that something you're involved in? Uh, well, I'm not sure if he was referring to farm murders or counterterrorism in general. Um, I what I can tell you is I think firstly people underestimate uh, what goes into overheads and in, in running an organization in in, in terms of you know, having a building and paying salaries and, and paying, you know, um, the expenses that you have to go to to make sure the systems are running, to make sure that you have a system that, that the database in terms of all the members' details is secure um, and all of that. Make, 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 make sure you pay ASCOM. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, rates and taxes, all of that. So that's it, probably the biggest chunk of our, 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 um, our budget. I do not have the budget breakdown um, with me. But, but what I can tell you is that we do spend a significant amount of, of, of money on, on um, security um, or not so much security or safety initiatives. Um, so to, what we do is uh, uh, to establish community safety structures all over the country. We have about the number goes up and down because if there's a structure that doesn't operate properly, we close it down. So the number goes up and down, but it's around 130. 150, uh, 150 to 150 mm -hmm. uh, local safety security structures. In other words, it's it's like a neighborhood watch. It's something like old commando system, but it's privately run. It's 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 um, uh, run through involvement by the local community, um, and through that we have obviously we have a. a a team of full-time employees who deal with that, who manage that, who do the admin, who work with the people and so forth. But other than the employees themselves, we have about 10,000 volunteers who are involved at, with these community safety structures. In other words, it's people all over the country who drive patrols, who have radio contact with each other um, in their communities. And in many cases, we find that when people see crimes, they call the AFRI Forum safety security uh, or, or local security structure before they call the police. And in many times when there are farm murders or farm attacks, we find that the Afri Forum structure is there before the police arrives. Um, uh, so that is part of the reality. Private security is is a real phenomenon in South Africa. We have more private security officers in South Africa than the police and the military combined. Um, and and so that's something that that we do invest in heavily. There are nearly 600,000 private security guards in South yep. Africa employed. It's the single largest sector of the economy, I think, at this point, larger than mining, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, we have about uh, the lo latest numbers I saw was about 190,000 um, uh, full-time police officers, uh, people employed by the South African Police Service, which means that there's about three times as many, almost three times as many people in private security in South Africa as there are members of, of the police. 
And I mean, people, I mean, people from, who are from South Africa who watch this would know that if you want to be safe in South Africa, you get private security. You don't get the police. No doubt. So uh, Paul Sheridan asked this question. I mean, not not for your answer. Can you donate all your super chats on this stream to Afri Forum? I'm sure they can. Af- you can afford it. I hope you don't mind me asking. Paul, I don't mind you asking at all. But but um, I, I don't have a good super chat game going there. It's it wasn't the purpose of my channel. I, I made I grudgingly made memberships available because people wanted to be part of the community and I and I, I don't really I don't uh, egg people on for super chats. Uh, I'd happy to do it, but the charge to send the money to South Africa is currently more than the total super chats have come on and come in on this. So if I <laughs> <laughs> if I were to go to MoneyGram, it would cost me more to send it than it would be for the, it's, it's less than $20. So, but I'm happy to do it. Maybe I do it uh, through um, PayPal or something like that. Uh, we'll, we'll check into that. But anyway, so there you go. So um, uh, this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, a channel that uh, spends a lot of time on that. Anyway, so um, now this Oak, I have no idea who this guy is. He's always on my channel, Aaron. I don't know. And he, he pretends his name is Aaron. I don't know what he goes. He goes by this, this username, the conscious character. I think he's trying to be clever. Yeah. He said, can you, can you get Aaron to tell the wholesome story about the boxes for farmers? in the free state is this about the um the arson and the fires there is that what that's about yes 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 it's uh, i saw conscious caracal was here he's a colleague of mine um in the chats and he's he's uh, he's putting me on a in a in a on the spot now because um, i was on leave this week and he's asking me to comment on what every forum did during the time when i was on leave but but i did follow it through social media i tried not to i tried to rest so i wasn't in contact with my colleague that much but it, it's a very gr- uh, great story. So, I mean, we had these horrible fires. I don't know what the total is now. Um, I believe it's more than 100 hectares that was burned down. Uh, massive, massive damage in, in the free state. And, how, and a lot of people came to us and also said, listen, we want to help in some way. So we started this initiative um, where people can, can pack a box with whatever they have uh, to give to send to these people um, for support, whether it be food, it can be clothes, it can be toys for children or anything. Um, and they can just put it in a box and bring it to our office and, and we'll, we'll make sure that it gets to the people who, whose property was burned down, people who are really suffering as a result of this fire. And I don't know what the total amount or the total weight was, but there are some clips on and pictures on social media. And basically, our office was full. Uh, there, there were truckloads full of boxes uh, that people sent uh, that, that eventually went uh, to these farmers. And not only the farmers, this this community. And it's a great story of a community that gets together, that sees this. And here's people who are in trouble. I don't know. I can't necessarily get in my car and, and drive over there to help extinguish the fires. But what I can do is I can pack a box uh, with with stuff, some of my stuff that I'm not using, or I can go and buy stuff and, and fill a box with, with whatever I can and have it sent to them. And and it's just, it's part of this amazing story of how people, uh, civil society and, and local communities in South Africa are helping each other and are realizing that you cannot be dependent on government. Uh, the government is the problem, not the solution. We cannot wait for government to, to support these people. Government isn't going to do that. If we send money to government to help these people, they're only going to steal it. Uh, I mean, and that's not even a joke. That's just the reality in South Africa. Um, so, so we just do it ourselves. And um, so the Solidarity, the union started this slogan recently, on soul self, we will do it ourselves. And, and it's, it's within that spirit to say, we're not waiting for government. We're going to do something ourselves. And, and it's, it's a great story of, of people getting together and rolling up their sleeves and becoming involved in a way in which they can make a difference. No, absolutely. And it's, uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right. You, you can't, whether it's private security or neighborhood patrols or it's uh, transportation, you're arranging things like that, or firefighting equipment and, and local fire brigades because the government is not showing up. It doesn't maintain its equipment if it even has equipment. It's a really, really sad situation, particularly with what happened there in Free State. Less than 48 hours after, of course, the number three in the economic freedom fighters stood on the stage at Senegal and uh, sang in Zulu and then made sure he put this part in English. Um, call the fire brigade, call the fire brigade, burn the boar, burn them out, burn them down. Um, and less yes. than 48 hours later, we see 247,000 uh, acres of land in the northern free state or, or around the vicinity of Herzogville, among other places, torched, houses destroyed, tra- tractors, farm equipment, barns, stores of grain, thousands of head of livestock, wild game, uh, farm laborers, homes burned. It's just horrific. And of course, unfortunately, we saw Tevi Nell. I haven't heard his status on him if he's still around, uh, but he was horrifically burned, second and third degree burns, trying to put the fire out. A lot of people 
people were rushing to try to help with the fire, and I tried to caution people. I said, listen, you know, if you, you don't have firefighting experience, uh, it's probably appreciated what you're doing, but you're putting yourself at risk. That's a very dangerous situation, particularly with the Veld fire. Winds change, and you get surrounded, and it's very dangerous. So anyway, that's uh, that's awesome that uh, Offrey Forum is doing that. Let me get to a couple more questions here really quick, and then I want to get to the Andile case, if you don't mind. Um, yes, yes. So, so we, we don't miss that before you're out of here. So mm -hmm. Yanni Meyer says there was a report that Offrey Forum asked for talks with Ramaposa. I don't know if that's recent, or can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that? Yes, it is recent. It's about a week ago. We sent a letter to uh, to President Ramaphosa in which it was after this whole cynical thing to, in which we explained what I've explained in this interview as well, that the anger about about the anger that was witnessed at uh, Brendan Warner's at the, the at least the, the hearing, the first hearing of the accused. It's not simply about the murder of 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 Horner himself. It's it's that as well, but it's a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's to explain this bigger picture, and the letter the letter is public. Uh, it's on our website as well, um, and to say that we want to discuss this with the state president. He he published a letter in which he condemned the murder, which is great, but it doesn't make any difference at all um, if it if it doesn't get, result in some form of a policy change or something act actually being done about farm murders. You know, the president writing a letter is pretty useless or irrelevant. So we did request a meeting with, with the state president and we did receive confirmation of receipt, um, but we're still waiting for, for feedback. Usually when we write, uh, we have a particular contact in the president's office to whom we send our letters and we usually get a response. Um, so I'm sure we will get a response. We'll see if the response is yes, the president will meet with you. Um, yeah, but All right, well, I'll, cool. I'll, I'll keep you guys posted. Well, thanks for that. So the Conscious Kirkle said, if you're living abroad, you can support Off Reform by becoming a friend of Off Reform, Google Friends of Off Reform. Well, you can also become a member of Off Reform from abroad if you want. Uh, but the problem is, uh, is they send me all the emails. Now, in its full disclosure, I'm not a member of Off Reform. I've never fin financially supported it. I just reported on it, try to stay objective. Uh, but I was curious about membership, and and it's great. But the problem is they send me all the uh, the emails in Afrikaans. Marek pratne Afrikaansni. Hey, hey, Afriform ek wachiao, ek wachiao. <laughs> so if is that they, your if they, Ronaldo impersonation? Oh, actually, yeah, that's a Ronaldo. <laughs> yeah, was it? That was yeah, that was it. I didn't realize that. That is, I guess, a Ronaldo impersonation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, go ahead. No, let me just elaborate on that a bit. You can. Um, we do actually, firstly, our language of operations is Afrikaans, um, and we we don't intend changing that because part of our mission is to create a future for Afrikaners. Mm -hmm. uh, but not, uh, but our communication to our members is not exclusively in Afrikaans. Um, um, we do have an English newsletter. So we have a weekly newsletter that we call the Funk Post, uh, and there's an English version of that as well. Um, so, so if you become a member, if you if you prefer the English one, you, we can send that to you as well. It's a bit tricky to be a member of Afri Forum if you live abroad, which is why we created this platform called Friends of Afri Forum. So you go to friendsofafriforum.com and you can fill in the form there and you can, through that platform, you can, for all practical purposes, become a member. But as with membership in South Africa, that means that you have to... Um, you have to make a monthly contribution, but we would really encourage people to do that. Great. So uh, we're going to get to the on daily thing, but uh, just uh, let me see if there's one more here. I want to get in before we get to on daily because I can't keep you here all day. Um, there is, where's is it at? Um, sorry, I, I, these questions are a little bit older now. So I asked Caesar's questions already. Oh, Jacques Vince said, do you guys really think that we'll be able to stop the ANC with legal means, people who have no regard for the law? Um, before you answer that, Ernst, I would say that not everyone in the ANC has no regard for the law. It's just that I've always told people anecdotally, the thing about the ANC, going back before Ramaphosa came out, I said, I've told people since 94, the thing about the ANC is about 60% of the people, this is historic, historic, I'm not saying it's contemporary, 60% of the people in the ANC are actually died in the wool, committed patriotic South Africans, many of whom believe in the multiracial society and, and, and equal equality and fairness, and, and, and they're okay with a market-based economy. But about 40% of the ANC have always been these died in the wool leftists, kill all the white people, chase all the minorities out, uh, expropriate, nationalize everything. And I said that that uh, when the day came that the balance shifted and the scales went to 50-50, 
then South Africa's in trouble. And in, in December 2017 at the Party Congress, when uh, Ramaphosa ran against Nkosazani Dalamizuma and he won by just 70 votes, I said that we are at knife's edge now. It's 50-50, it's and if it tips the other direction, and I'm concerned it's gone the other way. So, um, But back to the question. Um, Jock is saying that do you guys really think that, that legal means will stop the ANC? There's a great quote by Tuishis, the Afrikaans author, um, who said that um, we need to to pray with the knowledge that everything depends on God, but we also need to work as if everything depends on ourselves. And I'd, I, maybe I can use that quote or paraphrase that to answer the question, which is that that we we should use the legal means that are at our disposal um, as if it's going to to have a massive impact. But we must also work outside of the, the, um, our legal strategy. Um, I'm not saying outside of the law. I'm saying outside of our legal strategy. In other words, just organizing people and lobbying and, and just developing, building alternatives, building our, building our own university, building our own uh, media networks and so forth, um, as if this, this legal strategy is not going to work. So I can be pessimistic and say... This, the legal strategy is not going to work. Um, I have my doubts. I, 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 I actually did my master's degree on the South African constitution and the extent to which the South African constitution does not protect minorities the way it, it, uh, it promises to do. Uh, so I'm very skeptical about, you know, and it's, in South Africa, it's blasphemy to criticize the constitution, uh, but the constitution is worthy of criticism because it's, it sounds great if you read it in paper. But the question is, how is it implemented and how is it interpreted in practice? So there are some serious pitfalls or downfalls in, in the South African legal system. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't use it at all. Um, and um, Flip Bass always says we mustn't confuse strat uh, tactics with strategy. So the, our legal, what we do in the courts is more a tactic than it is a strategy. We don't believe, we believe it would be irresponsible and it would be myopic. To create, to try to create a future for minorities in South Africa simply by using the courts, uh, it's more a tactic. So sometimes you can get victories, you can you can achieve successes in the courts. Um, um, the strategy is to build institutions, to to build our own things, to make ourselves independent from government, to make sure that we pay as little tax as we can, if if that's part of the question. To, it, to make sure that we're not dependent on government educational institutions, on whatever other institutions, government institutions, and make ourselves state-proof as much as we can and, and develop our institutions through which we, we take care of our own community. Uh, but part of the tactic in, 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 in achieving this is we also need to, we always say we need to, in Africa, in, at AfriForum, we have the slogan, Fach and, Fach and Bow, which means fight and build. So we have to fight the the bad policies and while we're doing this we have to develop our own alternatives and and the legal strategy is uh, is is more tactic than a strategy and that's that's where the fighting comes in the strategy is on the building side so um, i'm gonna make make a comment from bram janser von rinsburg who said something and then i'm just going to get that last question and then on delay and then because we can't keep it here forever you've been very generous sure. with your time okay so uh, not that i'm trying to chase you off but uh, bram janser von rinsburg says i can speak a language that um chris can't speak uh be careful bram. <laughs> be careful bram uh i i i i Ek <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so the question i want to, uh, this is from very early in the chat it was a good question i think but um let me make sure i get it. graham or excuse me gareth newham uh oh no sorry sorry uh, hans asked a question he said gareth newham of the iss alleged that off reform is creating misconceptions in media that farm attacks are terror attacks now i think what hans is saying is that he hans thinks that um that he's siding with militant views, this Graham Newham. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Do you know about this? I, I've not read anything from ISS recently. So is Graham um, Newham claiming that you're creating misperceptions? I'm, I'm not sure. He might have said that. I, I don't think I've met him, uh, Mr. Newham, although I've read some either. of the stuff that he's, he's written. I know he's a researcher at, at the Institute for Security Studies. And, and based on only what I've seen through social media, which usually isn't a good indicator, I am concerned about his own bias because I've seen him make some comments that lead me to conclude that he, he has a very strong political, ideological, uh, 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 preconceived ideas at least, at least. 
that color his conclusions. Um, and I hope that I'm wrong. Um, I've only seen him comment. I've seen him comment on political things that that makes that you know leads me to be concerned about his his um, uh, some of his conclusions when it comes to things such as farm attacks. Um, but I hope that I'm wrong, and maybe one day if I meet him, I'll I'll, I'll see that I'm wrong on that. Um, I know he's done some great research, and I know he's a good researcher. Um, yeah, but other than that, I don't I don't really know. I can't comment any further just because I don't have the information. Yeah, same here. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I know a lot of the people at ISS, and I've met them. I've been there before, um, but I, I don't know. In fact, people are trying to get me to get Yaki Siliers on the program. Love to have Yaki on, but I, I hadn't asked him because when I write to him on LinkedIn I, or I post on his uh, things, I, he never really responds. So I think he, it's just one direction. He's not like back and forth. But but people said he's uh, someone's been in touch with Yaki, said happy to have him on the channel. So I'll have him on sometime soon. Okay, so let's shift for gears because you've been very generous with time. Oh, by the way, the e-begging worked, uh, worked out there, Ants, because a few people have been subscribing now. So, uh, let me try it again. So if you're not a subscriber to Chris White after, hey, take a second, reach. Look, a special price for you guys today because we had answer in the program. I'm going to cut you a deal. Today and today only, you can subscribe to Chris White Africa for absolutely nothing. Subscription is free all day long. Go ahead and subscribe. Of course, that, of course that's, that's every day on YouTube. It's membership that costs money. Anyway, so Ernst, um, you guys have a court case tomorrow against this buffoon. I'm, you know, I can say that. I'm not in South Africa and I'm not denigrated. It's not, that's not criminal injuria. By buffoon, I mean this guy is a clown. He's an absolute clown. He's a dangerous clown and fortunately got very little support in the 2019 election. But this uh, chap called Andile, who is for Black Lives First, Black Land First or something like that. Uh, can you tell us about that case and what it's all about? Yes, so it's a continuation of the case. It's it's already started um, earlier, I think last year, about a year ago, and it was we couldn't finish on the days that was set to court, so we had to set a different date. Um, so we're continuing the case tomorrow, and it's about comments that he made. Um, I believe it was during the election, the the nine uh, the the last political election when when they actually stood as a party, and they didn't get a lot of support. In fact, I've got the amount here. They they got about nineteen thousand seven hundred and ninety six votes uh, out of the whole of South Africa. So it's not an organization that has a lot of support. It's an organization that gets a lot of attention in the media. Um, they regularly get invited to to participate in panel discussions, but it's the most extremist, racist organization that I know of in the world. Um, and so this guy, Andile Nitama, who's their leader, made a political speech where the context is a bit strange. Um, uh, Johan Rupert, the, the billionaire, had a, spoke at an event where he spoke about, I think he said something, it was probably two years ago, about his connections in the taxi industry. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, Andile came out and he said, oh, so Johan Rupert, of course, who has a lot of money, is rich, so he's evil because the BLF is also very communist. Um, um, and so he's, he then said, oh, so Johan Rupert has, has meetings, has connections in the taxi industry. So, so um, that means that every time a black person is murdered as a result of taxi violence in, the, in this you know, section of society, it's actually a murder committed by Johan Rupert, who's this representative of the white people. That's basically his line of reasoning. And then he made this horrific speech about killing five whites from now on for every time a black person gets murdered in South Africa. And he said, we're going to kill, we're going to kill the whites. We're going to kill the five whites. Every time a black person gets killed, we're going to kill their, their wives. We're going to kill their children. We're going to kill their dogs. We're going to kill their cats. And he went on like that. Uh, which is very obviously a case of hate speech. Uh, so we filed a complaint uh, charges at the Equality Court. Uh, the case has, case has already started. I'm actually currently under, uh, still in testimony. Uh, I'm still under oath at the moment because uh, I was being examined by our advocate, uh, Mark Oppenheimer, who's an expert in, in constitutional law and in free speech in particular and in hate speech. Um, um, and um, he, he was basically wrapping up when we ran out of time. So I'm still, when we start tomorrow, I'm going to finish my testimony. And then the in interesting thing is going to happen is I'm going to be cross-examined on farm murders by the legal representative of Black First Land First. So I'm very interested and curious about what's going to happen there. Um, but that's going to be tomorrow. And the case is on the roll, I think, for two days. So I, I'm sure and I hope that we will wrap it up. Within two days, um, what we're asking for is a declaration that what he said was hate speech and that a sum of money be paid by him 
to an organization that works with the victims of farm murders and that he must issue a public apology for his comments, which of course would be very difficult for him to do. Um, so I don't think we're going to, just in terms of, if we're not going to hear an outcome of the case in two days because the standard procedure is you have the arguments and then usually the judgment is sort of postponed because the judge or the magistrate in this case has to go through the arguments again and write a, a ruling. So, um, so I'm not sure when we'll get that, but I hopefully we'll finish the, the, the case with before the end of this week. No, that's interesting. You guys have pursued a number of cases uh, against the government, uh, against individuals who misbehaved. And um, that's, as you mentioned, that's one of the, the tactics or techniques that you are out there helping uh, support minorities. Someone a bit early in the chat said, why, why doesn't Africa Forum drop the, the tag uh, minority rights and, and focus on all South Africans because you're excluding blacks? Uh, the fact that you're focused on minority rights doesn't mean you're excluding black South Africans. They too can support off reform. They can support rights for minorities. I mean, here in the United States, black Americans make up 13.5%, but most of the people who are running around you know, doing things supporting organizations are actually white Americans for equality for blacks. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's just the inverse there. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Matthew Finlayson said, Finlayson said, can we get 400 likes? Well, we're a long way from 400 likes. We got 285. So you're going to have to get those 400, 500 people watching right now to start smashing that like button for us to get there. And then um, Jake, Jake's J asked, can uh, ask Aaron St what is what's this? Oh, ask about a signed copy of Kill the Boar. What's this? Ask Aaron Rhodes what about a signed copy of Kill the Boar with EFF? I, I don't get that. That's crazy. And Hans uh, lives in Aranya and is a staunch supporter of Off Reform. That's awesome. Hans, I don't know if you started watching the channel after I interviewed Yus uh, Streidem or not, uh, but uh, appreciate you being here. Neil Jeffrey says, just to let you both know, I live abroad and people I meet constantly ask about South Africa and what is happening with the killing of farmers. People are becoming more aware. Well, that's certainly been part of my effort. It's not just the farms. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about South Africans in general. It's just, it's truly horrific, the level of violence, the disregard for life. I mean, the execution of underpaid uh, security guards who are doing cash in transit. I just saw another one where a guy was just executed. He offered no resistance, put his hands up, dropped the money, stepped away, and they pushed him to the ground and, and put a bullet in the back of his head. This this is vile. It's it's out of control. All right, Ernst. Um, so uh, what have you guys uh, got going on? Because in the last uh, couple of months, you've been quite busy with, I mean, of course, the situation in Seneca, the peaceful demonstration took place, and then a few people got a little bit out of hand. One vehicle was turned over. Next thing you know, it's like the Second World War, like a genocide was committed by a small group of South Africans. So that was on the 6th of October. You were there for that, if I'm not mistaken. And then we had the events on the 16th when the second arraignment was supposed to take place. And, and of course, you know, uh, the EFF went there because it's their mission, not the SAPs, not the SANDEF, not the intelligence services, not the bureaucracy of South Africa. It is the explicit mission of a political party to protect state property. So, of course, they went to Seneca where they protected state property, except they tore down street signs, smashed concrete rubbish bins, left all the trash on the street. So you guys were there for that as well. Um, I don't know if you guys were uh, did any Black Monday things or events or if you were at the Vitkois Monument this year, another 53 crosses erected, unfortunately. Um, have you guys been involved in those things? And, and if so, what have you got coming up in the near term that, that people might be able to help out? Yeah, there was a massive um, Black Monday gathering in, in Cape Town. I was actually invited to speak there, and I'm very sad that I wasn't able to, but I had a very good reason not to be there is um, – my my son was baptized on on that day so i had to to excuse myself from um, from that event um but it it seems to me to have been a massive success and we can see that there's a lot more energy among people i think people th there's been some sort of a change in in the psyche of people in this country minorities and or afrikaners or farmers or however you want to define them to feel like maybe we can actually achieve something through through showing up at events like this because we've had these events repeated events and they keep getting bigger and bigger um um it started we, when did it, we, did it start with Hartswater or dendron i think Hartswater was the first one with that triple farm murder then there was one at dendron there was one at i'm not even going to remember all of them now by by, by the top of my head I'll obviously sienacal bronco sprite dalmast um, we've had the, the gathering in, in um, at the Witkreis Monument. Uh, we've had it in Cape Town. So more and more people people are, are showing up by the thousands at these events uh, in which they, they protest against farm murders. And it's becoming a hot potato that the South African government doesn't know how to deal with. And that's one of the reasons why we're saying to the state president, well, we need to talk to you about this. There's some practical things that you can do that you aren't doing. Um, so we'll see. But we'll see if we can get that meeting. 
But uh, I think the good, there's a lot of bad news about South Africa, but part of the good news is we're getting a lot of, we're building up a lot of momentum in, in this fight. And I think that's, that's something that, um, that's, that's, that's worth celebrating. I agree. Absolutely. I, I think that um, from what I've seen, definitely since, uh, since the lockdown was eased a bit back in June uh, and farm attacks have picked up, it's really, but we got to keep the momentum going. We got to make sure the world, uh, the world must know, hashtag the world must know what's happening in South Africa. And so that's been something I've been trying to focus on to get people outside South Africa to know about this. <clears throat> but I'll tell you what, I think one way we can guarantee huge crowds at any event you guys have is I just got to get the Trumpster to come to South Africa. If he comes to South Africa, I mean, listen, this dude was in a rural county in Western Pennsylvania yesterday, which barely has, you know, a few tens of thousands of residents, 57,000 people showed up for his rally. And this is when a lot of people are actually genuinely scared of COVID and afraid of getting it. Imagine if there was no COVID, 57,000 people. Joe Biden had 50 people show up and they were all excited about in the press. They wet their nappies because, oh, look at that. We're so excited. Trump had 57. That, by the way, he did five rallies yesterday. If we could get Trump to come to South Africa, um, that would certainly draw some attention. That would be amazing. Yeah. Well, 57,000 people is an incredibly large audience. That's like, it's like the Foo Fighters showing up to play or Metallica arriving. You know, it's it's a very big for, for some of the biggest uh, musicians in, in the in the world. Um, so and, and that's I mean, we'll see what happens with the election. And I'm not trying to make predictions. Um, but I, I mean, we we can see even from South Africa that there's there seems to be we can see the polls, you know, leaning towards Biden. Um, but they did. They, they also did with with Clinton. But there seems to be this energy at the Trump rallies that's sort of hard to to miss. Or you, you you should consider that as well. And I think it's so we'll see what happens with the election. But but there's at least there's something happening um, on ground level. Um, and there's this uh, there's this movement. Um, this uh, what what we've been describing it as is a mainstream conservative movement across the globe. I'm not talking about crazy right wingers or you know, Q Klux Klan groups, it's mainstream, moderate conservatives. What I mean by moderate is it's people who are, it's peace loving conservatives who want mutual recognition and respect. They want, they don't want war. They want to, they simply want their heritage to be respected and protected. And they want their identity to be protected. They want to, they want their history to be respected and um, they want respect. Um, and they want to give respect as well. And um, that's at least my, that, that, that's how I describe the, the, find the mainstream conservative movement. And, and it started probably in 2016, or at least most significantly with both uh, Trump and Brexit. Um, and, and we've had all these, you know, European movements, um, um, parties gaining a lot of support. So th it's a reality. And even if Trump loses the election, it's not going to mean that this, 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 massive mainstream conservative movement is, is just going to disappear it's just it's just growing in support and it's uh, we can see that with what people describe as the the democratic recession um with with countries sort of this backlash it's not some, it's not a backlash against democracy it's a backlash against liberal democracy um and and that is just gaining momentum so we'll see what happens but i think there's there's certainly some interesting uh, years ahead for us well, the thing is, this is, is, is Ernst, is that um, the people have gone so far and abandoned the, the, the center and even the center left that they're just outrageous radicals. I mean, the traditional liberal, those who believe in traditional liberal beliefs, have become the, the center and the right. I mean, I, I, I'm not a, I, I'm conservative, but I'm certainly not far to the right. And many of the things that I hold to be valuable are things that I had in common with traditional liberals in the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. But they've lost their freaking minds. They've lost their minds. They, 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 I, they've been drunk with this totalitarian fascist stuff and, and this scandemic and political nonsense. So the rest of us are kind of stuck here going, uh, we didn't leave the party. Everybody left us. Where you know, I mean, not not the political party, but we we showed we rocked up at yeah. the party. We rocked up at the bry, and and we were all having a good time. And then everybody left, and now they're over there throwing stones at us and burning down our house and calling us names. What happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And 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 I mean, we've seen it. We 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 keep seeing it in in the mainstream media. Where um, <laughs> I was in a television interview the other day, and I made the comment about. I sort of in passing, I said Afri Forum is a moderate organization. Um, you know, we're not we're not a crazy right wing group. You can call us conservative, 
um, nationalist. As a matter of fact, we've explicitly rejected white nationalism. Uh, you, uh, you can look it up. Yep. Uh, and, and, you know, we condemn all forms of racism, white racism, black racism alike. Um, and I, I'm sort of in passing made a comment that we're a moderate group. And the journo, that's the issue. That's the, 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 the thing I said that he took issue with. He said, I, I have a problem with you describing yourself as a moderate group. And we'll, we'll have to have a separate discussion about that. But I mean, what, I, you know, it's a strange thing where, where you, if your view isn't openly left wing, then you are regarded as a far right winger. That's that's the crazy situation we're in. But it's not sustainable, and that's why there's this backlash. Um, and and they don't understand the backlash. They don't understand why people are voting for Trump. They don't understand why why people in in the UK don't want to be in the European Union. They don't understand it. it it's because they don't know how crazy they are in the first place. And that's the problem. <laughs> well, again, it comes back to the point I think you, we made in the beginning: is these people are detached from reality. Uh, not all of them. Some of them know exactly what they're doing and they just don't care because they profit from the confusion. They profit from the chaos. They profit from, in many ways financially and political power. Mm. So that's part of it too. All right. So I'd love to keep you for hours more, but I'm not going to do that to you. That's unfair because I want to get you back. So, I mean, if, if I keep you for three hours, then, sure. then then Ronaldo will win the argument. Oh, Chris Wyatt has these marathon streams. He never lets people off his channel. <laughs> 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 Ronaldo Jose. Ek watch you Yes. Ek watch you <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, there was, this is this is for the benefit of Alfred Forum as well. So Kate Cross asked this question. She said, hey, I'm signed up with Alfred Forum and do and do donate. What else can the average South African citizen do to help? And, and I think that's the last question we'll ask you there, Ernst. Uh, what else can people do to help out uh, the situation yeah. in South Africa and, and Alfred Forum in particular? Well, if you're in South Africa, you the first thing you can do is you can become a member, but you can also become involved. Um you can become involved through our, our one of our branches. Uh, we've got some exciting things coming up with um, with how we plan on making you know making a bigger impact on ground level and and strengthening our local structures. But through these structures, we also have national conferences and congresses where we all get together as members and all, all the representatives from all over the country, and um, and we have annual general meetings and and through that people can become more involved. Um, Maybe that I think that would be my my main recommendation. And if you don't live in South Africa, you can you can join through Friends of Afri Forum. Um, and regardless of whether you're in South Africa or outside of South Africa, the main thing or one of the main things in what that you can do to help is just to raise awareness, to talk about this issue, to to write to your if you're in the US, for example, you can write to your representative. Um, in South Africa, it doesn't help write. You can write to the ANC if you want, but but. Um, you can you can write to some of the opposition parties uh, and ask them to raise this issue in parliament. Uh, you can write to your newspaper. You can you can comment in comment sections. You can subscribe to channels such as these and and support people who raise awareness. Uh, there's a lot that you can do just to help spread the word about the problem. And the more we can spread, spreading the word alone isn't sufficient. But spreading the word is the most important first step that that we can take to to get to some practical solutions. I think that's excellent. I um, appreciate that very much. Well, Ernst uh, Rutz, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the channel. Um, uh, hopefully, when I get to South Africa, we can link up. If you get back to Washington, I'm close to sure. Washington. We can touch base. And I, yes. can, I can tell you which, which uh, swamp creatures to avoid uh, when, you're, <laughs> when you're down in the swamp. But anyway, thank you so much. I'm glad we finally got you on the channel. And um, we didn't really talk much about Senegal and, and specifically about farmers. We talked in general about those. So maybe we can talk about those events or whatever the events of the day are next time we get together. But anyway, you're welcome back anytime on the channel if you want to come on here. And the good news is that, um, is that while a lot of my, my subscriber base has been uh, South African, and I'm very grateful for that. It's awesome. Uh, the number of folks here in the U.S. has been growing a lot recently. I did uh, the Trump live stream last night, and I was amazed at how many Americans were watching the stream last night when I did that. So uh, it's, it's good news because the more Americans are watching, the more we become aware of this, the more they talk to the representatives and raise this issue. And one thing is certain, uh, we can't say this about South African politics, but, but members of Congress who have to run for office every two years tend to be very attentive to their constituents who make a lot of noise. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. No doubt about that here in the United States. Anyway, Ernst, thanks a lot. Any last comments you'd like to say before, before you head out? No, maybe I can just I can just stress what you've said because I've witnessed it firsthand. Um, in when in one of the um, the was it in the I can't remember if it was in the House or the Senate, but one of the, the representatives we spoke with uh, was actually a staff member, mm -hmm. not the representative himself, who said that 
we're so glad to have Afri Forum and to speak with you because we've already received three emails from our constituents asking us what are we going to do about farm murders. And, and the fact that only three emails can make such an impact, um, is, it shows how big an impact you can make. If we can get people by their hundreds to write to their senators to say, listen, we want you to, to express your concern about what's happening in South Africa. Uh, we don't want you to declare war or do anything you know, drastic. Just at least make a public statement and say, listen, there's a problem in South Africa. That alone is already a lot um, that, will, that will give a lot of momentum. Um, so we've, we've seen it. We've spoken with people in Washington who have said to us, we, we are now going to write back to these constituents and say to them, we had a meeting with Afri Forum and this is what we, you know, what we discussed and this is what we think we can do. So it really makes a difference. If you're in the U.S., it makes a big difference if you write to your constituents, if you write to your representative at least, and 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 ask them to make us to to make a state to, to take a stance on this issue. Absolutely. So, uh, rugby fan. Um, actually, I'm not so much a team sportman. I'm a skateboarding fan. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, right. it, but but the extent to which I watch rugby, I am a Bulls fan. Yes. I I it was an so, assumption so, on my part. You've part. got the right jersey on. Yeah, it was an assumption. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, and it's uh, bye bye donkey. It was a pleasure having you on the channel. I appreciate us finally being able to get together and to um. Your, your friend there, that Oak the Conscious Caracal, thanks for needling him and, and reminding him a couple of times to, to, to come on the channel. So I'm grateful for that. Anyway, uh, we'll catch you uh, next time and good luck with Offer Forum. And uh, let's hope that um, people get their act together and send the message to the ANC in 2021 municipal elections that um, enough is enough. It's time to govern or move on. Anyway, that's my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So with that, uh, I'll let him uh, exit the stream and then uh, I'll uh, hang with you guys just a second here. So I'll let you drop out there, Ernst. OK, there you go, folks. Well, folks, thanks for tuning in. This has pretty been awesome. Been pretty awesome. OK, now it's e-begging time. All right. Where, where, where are the subscriptions? There are so many people here who are watching the stream. I know you're not all subscribers to Chris White Africa. Trust me, you'll enjoy the content here. It doesn't cost anything. Go ahead and become a subscriber right down there. And you might be surprised by some of the content you find. I talk about business. I talk about defense, security, culture, promote Afrikaans language, Afrikaans music, but not just that. Promote music in general and culture in general. A big affinity for Afrikaans and for uh, Tswana or Setswana, as we call it in Botswana, and also for the Basutu people. So we, we promote all of those groups here on the channel and Africa in general. So cover all the continents. So feel free to uh, become a subscriber and the likes we're getting close wow i didn't think we we're gonna make we were 270 i think or 260 when someone mentioned can we get to 400 likes we're at 379 likes folks if we can get there push it up to 400 that really be really awesome and thank you so much for the super chats there were a few super chats here uh, and uh, I think it was Phil that asked me if I could uh, donate the Super Chats. Um, I won't donate Super Chats because then it'll be even less money. But what I'll do is I'll take a look at maybe um, if we can't do something to help them out. Uh, and maybe in the future, if people want that, we can do a stream in which uh, we talk about a big topic with Offer Forum. And then what we can do is maybe donate those, those Super Chats. But uh, for those who don't know, uh, YouTube takes 30% of Super Chats. So the amount you give... Um, if I give that amount, then I'll just, I'll give more. Well, actually I had quite a few super chats here. Just, uh, they're smaller ones, but uh, Flying Board gave a super chat early on about uh, Aaron's going to the States. Then Shane gave a super chat. Flying Board gave another one about changing the street to Hendrick Favud. That was funny. DC Sylvester Celine gave one. Um, and then uh, Flying Boar, Malcolm Stark, Flying Boar had another one. And Gopalang Lakota said, do you, what do you think of John Steenhuisen? I'm sorry I didn't get to ask that question there. My apologies for Gopalang. Uh, I can try to ask uh, his thoughts on Steenhuisen, but I'm I'm going to guess it's probably a positive view of John Steenhuisen, uh, who was just yesterday elected formally as the leader of the opposition Democratic Alliance in South Africa. So there you go, folks. All right. Uh, people are fleeing the stream right now because they've heard what they want to hear. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll do a Night Owls edition tonight. I'm still preparing for teaching the Department of Commerce tomorrow. Remember, tomorrow can be a pretty crazy day because I won't be available till evening for South Africa time. Thank you, Adrian Tysa for just um, subscribing there because I'll be teaching in the morning and then we have the elections, but I will be on tomorrow on my channel. I may potentially be on Joe Emilio's channel as well as Ode Moja's conversation about the elections and I'll be live streaming the election results at 7.15, 19.15 tomorrow Eastern Standard Time, which will be uh, early morning in South Africa and Botswana. But feel folks, feel free to um, Ben Hashem says, I feel sick to my stomach. I watched five minutes of Biden rally. No, I, it's fun to watch a Biden rally. Yeah, so uh, just go to uh, joeohioslash.com xpyz 
uh, you know, you know, you know the thing, the thing. Uh, it's uh, Joe at text Joe three zero zero seven zero zero three zero. Yeah, yeah, corn pop, corn pop. Yeah, it is quite painful to watch. Uh, and he just now he just makes up words. And so I was talking about what did he just say? I was talking about what the hell did he just say? No idea. Folks, it's really sad. I think it's elder abuse. Um, someone should take care of that gentleman and get him the care he needs. Uh, hopefully that care will be not with a White House physician. We'll leave that in the hands of Donald John Trump for the next four years. Well, thanks for tuning in, folks. Uh, 398 likes. Wow, we are so close. On the verge. Right on the precipice. Leaning over. I feel like a Marikat. By the way, did anybody see the Marikat? You guys see the Marikat? Right back there is a Marikat. Check that out. TM just subscribed. Thank you for subscribing. See the Marikat back there? I put a Marikat. That was the Easter egg. Anyway, so... Sleepy Joe. Creepy Joe crawls out of his bunker. Looking around. Anyway, folks, there you go. All right, we got to the 400. Oh, excellent, excellent. All right, thanks, folks. Uh, nearly two hours on the stream. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, my many thanks to my my special feature guest, today, Ernst Ritz. It was uh, a long journey to get you on the channel because you're a busy guy. But thank you for coming on the channel. Really appreciate it. We were all over the place uh, because of the telecommunications problems on your end. But we, we did get to the topics that were critically important here. Also talking about your court case tomorrow. Good luck in the court case and the cross-examination <laughs> from, from the attorney from the other side. That should be entertaining to say the least. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Erica loves Maricats. Yeah, Maricats are really, really cool. Maricat Manor, that's a pretty cool show. I enjoy that one. Sideliner Opinion says, if the Americans choose Biden as next president, my estimation Americans in general will take a big knock. Yeah, well, you're not alone, Sideliner. <laughs> I'll be shaking my head going, what is wrong with people? Food streaming in for burn farms at Bosov. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andre Hartsleaf. I appreciate that at Bosov. Thank you for sharing that. Lou Jordan, Sleepy Joe's a clone. <laughs> is he really? Uh, and uh, Jenny Geyer says we're over. Okay, go to get the 420s to JP. Anyway, folks, I got to get back to preparing these slides uh, for my teaching courses coming up. So God bless. Thank you so much. Uh, there may be a Night Owls edition tonight. If it is, it'll probably be centered around another Trump rally. By the way, Donald Trump is doing five more rallies today. And if you count the one that started, Chris Schultz, thank you so much for becoming a subscriber. If you count the one yesterday that started at 11, 20, 23, 20, or 23, 40 last night, 20 minutes before midnight, it ran past midnight. So technically he had five yesterday and you count part of that today that gives him six rallies around the country. It is unbelievable, ladies and gentlemen. Donald Trump is sprinting to the finish line. Meanwhile, Sleepy Joe popping up out of his burrow like a mare cat looking to see what's going on with his glasses. Did you see his glasses? Sleepy Joe has got the glasses on now, folks. You got to love it. He's got the glasses on. Check it out. Now, I don't have the aviator glasses, but it's kind of like this. So, Sleepy Joe. Creepy Joe. Joe Biden. That's right. The known plagiarist. Kicked out of university for plagiarism. Kicked out of the presidential race because he stole Neil Kinnock's labor speech. Can you imagine that? Sleepy Joe, 47 years in government, accomplished nothing except the crime bill that he wrote and sponsored back in 1994, which incarcerated lots of black American men. By the way, they committed crimes, so they probably should be incarcerated, but it was particularly particularly draconian law that was unfair in the way that it allocated punishment, the way it was meted out. Anyway, so there you go, folks. Um, no, I'm not ZZ Top. This is Chris Wyatt, just in case you're curious. Uh, those guys are a little bit older than I am. Anyway, folks, yeah, Trump is the Energizer Bunny. That guy is just full of energy. I think he's an alien. Uh, I think he's an alien. I, I'm not sure he's actually human. He's got all that energy. 74 years old. The dude just had Wuhan coronavirus. A couple weeks ago, he had Wuhan coronavirus, COVID-19, and he kicked its bum. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to talk about leaders. Leaders set a positive example. They inspire people. When you hear Donald Trump from the stump, he's talking about Americans, black, white, brown, yellow, Christian, Muslim, or all Americans would do this together. That's what he's talking about. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is busy calling him all kinds of names. He's a bigot. He's a racist. What the hell is that? That's not real. And by the way, that's Donald Trump who's genuine. That's genuinely who the guy is. Anyway, he has got lots and lots and lots of energy. This guy is amazing. Let's, let's push him to the finish line if you're here in America by voting tomorrow on the 3rd of November. I will rock up and I will vote for Donald Trump at the voting polling station here in Pennsylvania, a critical battleground state with 20 electoral college votes could make the difference in the election, likely to make the difference in the election. My prediction is that Donald Trump will win Pennsylvania. Hopefully he'll win it by a comfortable enough margin so that we have to wait 10 days for the mail-in ballots. It won't make a difference in the end. Anyway, folks, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Uh, we're down about 300 people, so I'm going to drop out of here. Thanks for 400, 412 likes. Thank you for the super chats, the people I just mentioned. 
And thank you to my guest, uh, one Ernst Ritz from Offer Forum. Thank you so much for that, folks. God bless and have a good day. We're going to wrap it out here. And I'll be back for a little bit later on tonight with the um, with the uh, Night Owls edition. And, we'll, and if Trump is on, then we'll have Trump. <laughs> and I'll comment on the background. All right, folks, God bless. And we'll catch you later here on Chris White Africa for the Night Owls edition. And here we go. I know my mic is still on.